Hello, TEDx Sydney Salon. I pronounced it correctly. Salon. 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 I want to note that I gave up the remote, so Sandra's in charge, make no mistake. There's two of us, okay? So strap yourselves in. Strap yourselves in. We're here to start you off with the fact that we think each and every one of you will have a relationship to artificial intelligence. And that relationship might be working with it, working alongside it, governing it, building it for some of you. Working for it, befriending it. But um, most importantly, whenever you enter into a new relationship, you should do some due diligence. Okay? And for AI, that starts all the way back in 1956. More precisely, it starts in 1956 at the Dartmouth Conference, a time where 47 blokes got together. Yeah, no women were harmed in the making of AI back then, so. <laughs> 47 blokes got together for what is now called a conference, which, to be fair, ladies and gentlemen, was more like a two-month-long workshop, actually more like a two-month long summer camp, and about 11 of those guys did show up to all the meetings. But they had this idea of basically building intelligent machines. And the way they were going to go about it is to teach machines everything that we know. Encode very precisely, that's where coding comes from, encode very precisely into machines everything we knew, how we make decisions, the rules to chess, everything. Say you wanted to teach a computer what a cat was. You would have to tell the computer that the cat's an animal and it's got two eyes and a nose and a belly and a back and it can be black, it can be white, um, it's got a tail. Everything about the computer. And to be fair, that worked really, really well for a while. Gave us the first, ch first chatbot, Eliza, you might have heard of. Um, so worked really well, but then cracks started to appear. And these cracks started to appear very quickly because it turns out if you get that three-legged cat from the pound, it's still a cat, right? If you get one of them Picasso cats, you know, the ones with the eyes all messed up, that's still a cat, and you would have to tell the computer that's still a cat. If you get one of them bald cats, you know, the ones they give people with allergies, the freak me out. <laughs> really freaky ones, that's still a cat. We had to teach the computers everything. And then we encountered what is now lovingly called the common sense problem, because it turns out you can't actually explain all the things that we take for granted to a computer. So, so, so very quickly, kind of the money dried up, and we entered what is known as the first AI winter. Mm. For 59 episodes, nothing much happened, ladies and gentlemen, um, except for nerds in universities like us kept at it and kept trying to figure out some other way to do artificial intelligence. And by the late 70s, the early 80s, we figured out a new way of doing cats, and it was also the last time we did cats well. The insight that we had back then carries us all the way to ChatGPT and the AI that we have today. So, and that insight was very simple. Yeah. So rather than you know, explain to the computer what a cat is, it takes a long while, as we figured, um, you show it pictures and let it find commonalities in those pictures and encode these as patterns into large mathematical structures. So pattern recognition. That was a brilliant new idea, but two more things had to happen to get us to how we know AI today. And that is, we needed a lot of pictures of cats, a lot of data. Yeah. So technical term that we learned when he came to Australia, a shit ton of pictures. <laughs> It's, it's a unit, unit of, measurement, of measurement, to be yeah. fair. Yeah, it's a unit of measurement. So we needed the internet, and we also needed the, a lot more computing power, which was the inside that, hang on, if you just use graphics cards rather than CPUs, you can make this much, much faster. If you're NVIDIA, you can also make yeah. a lot of money, but you know, you get the point. And that, and that worked really well. That worked really well. Now, that's the reason that when you go to the doctor today, there is AI to find patterns in images to get you to better diagnosis. It also might have gotten you here much faster today on an AI-enabled bus across the bridge, green lighting those traffic lights to get you here in time. We got really, really good at finding patterns in data, and we had lots of images, so mm. we could find lots of patterns. And then at some point, just before COVID, 
we had this brilliant insight. Another nerd. Another in a nerd. University. Yeah, in a university. If we could find patterns in data, what if we flipped those algorithms and got them to generate a pattern like the one we've seen before? And turns out we had lots and lots of pictures of people. So the first images that we generated, BC, before COVID, were images, were images of people. We were doing image generation. These are all fake people generated before COVID by the New York Times, uh, because they do have a Good. bit more money, more money and a bit and more, more time. <laughs> a bit more time than the University of Sydney to keep generating pictures of of people. Now we figured that what works for images also works for text. If we find patterns in text, we can also generate text. But we needed a lot of text. A lot of text again, you know how much. Um, we needed the internet. That is the New York Times and the University of Sydney website and Wikipedia and and, and also Reddit. Reddit. And 20% of this mm. is links out of Reddit, including that subreddit that Kai should not have opened last night, definitely not have sent to the entire team. So all of that. The good, the bad and the ugly. <laughs> so but we find relationships between words, right? We don't actually store any of the text. We encode relationships between words in large mathematical structures, artificial neural networks, the same technology we invented in the 1980s. And when the relationship is severed, all this thing has is those patterns to generate things. We call that a large language model. You know it as ChatGPT. At this point, I feel we have lost some of you. Where are you going? I was with you, with yeah. the cats, and so on. Yeah. So, what, <laughs> um, so what we built is something that works very differently to yeah. us people. Take all of us in the room. The word cat for us is the letter C-A-T. -A -T. This is what the word cat looks like for a large language model. It's a set of statistical probabilities, relationships between the word cat and any other word in the English language that matters to the word cat. It might be the word dog, or the word pet, or the word oven, Fish. or... Whatever. <laughs> By the way, if you can't see it, don't worry about it. Uh, we are here to help you out. Oh. There it is. Oh, and because we've been told there's a wild mouse somewhere here on the loose, um, we thought we'll give you gratuitous cat pictures, right? Yeah. Just for good measure. <laughs> Light entertainment at, at, mm. at Luna Park. But it turns out that if you can do this and find a different way of thinking about intelligence, you actually change some really, really important things. One is our relationship to writing. It is now a relationship, often a relationship to AI. If you're starting a document from scratch, AI is there to help you write. If you're writing an email, AI is there to help you draft that really long email about that subreddit that you shouldn't have said last night. If you are starting a LinkedIn post, AI is there to help you write that LinkedIn post. And if you're like me, you turn that off. And when you're finished, it it's tells you, there. let me help you make it better with AI. But our relationship to writing is fundamentally changing and becoming one mediated by AI. And so is our relationship to pictures, to images. So any of you who might have a Google Pixel phone or a Samsung, I won't ask, you won't admit it anyway, but you are ahead of the Apple crowd because you have uh, image generation on your phone. One swipe and those blokes at the party who just wouldn't smile, worry not. Um, or you wanted to take a picture of that bee and you were a little bit too slow, just draw it and let AI magically put it into the picture. But your relationship to video is also changing. It was only a year ago that we could put a prompt, like a cat waking up their owner on a lazy Sunday morning and you would get an image. Six months ago, with systems like uh, Sora, we now put in the same prop, the cat waking up their owner on a lazy Sunday morning, and we generate videos. Yeah. Not perfect. You might have spotted. There's a, show it again. There's an extra leg, just for good measure. You know, so cute. Look at her. Hmm. You know, there's the leg. When it's like, in the, in the, oops, there it is again. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, not perfect. Yet. So our, our relationship to video is also changing. But so is our relationship to voice. Hello, attendees at today's TEDx Sydney Salon event. You are hearing my voice being AI generated in real time. This only took one minute and a half of audio training of myself talking. Pretty good, huh? Imagine what else it can do. Maybe I should get a word in too, or maybe we let real Sandra and Kai continue. And now the magic is not that we can do this. We've been able to do this for years, but we can now do this 
in minutes with a minute and a half of my voice from the public domain with software that we all have access to and that costs $5 a month. We've democratized these relationships so much that they're now in every aspect of our life. We have assistance, whatever we start writing or working with text in any kind of organization, we have an assistant there to help us. We're coding, we have a co-pilot to help us code. We're designing new drugs. We have generative AI to fold proteins for us and to help us with and drug discovery. And you will never be alone because there's an AI companion everywhere now, right? You know, pop stars and you name it. Yeah, so that can, is Mark Twain. Yeah, that is Mark Twain. That's not Mark Twain. But it will also change the relationship to ourselves. This, by the way, is a real video of me, not a fake one, mostly just to show audiences that I do sometimes have good hair days. With many solutions powered by AI. The robots are not going to take all of our jobs, though they are still coming for fill in accounting. <laughs> the future is already here. This is not actually Sandra. I am an AI avatar of her using only a couple of minutes of video of the real Sandra for training. All you need to do is type a script, and voila. You have a digital version of you, ready for anything. Don't worry about real Sandra being replaced. I'm not here to take over her job. I'm here to make her job easier. But I can't say the same for Phil from accounting. Sorry, Phil. So. We want you to think about AI not as a thing that comes to replace you, because it works very differently to humans, right? Pushing you aside. That's not we, the way we want you to think about it, but rather to have a relationship with AI, to do all the various things that you can now do with AI that you couldn't do before. So we want to leave you with this thought. What will your relationship with AI be? Thank, Thank you very you. much.